Um, first of all, I wanted to say thank you to Nima for uh, hosting us here and to Patrick for the wonderful facilities. And thank you all for being here as well. Where is my slides? Okay. Um, I just want to uh, make sure that anybody who's taking notes, put your notepads down. There's a lot of content on the slides. I've decided not to remove all of it. I could spend hours on every single slide. Don't worry about it. I'm going to emphasize the really important things on every single slide. So uh, there's a lot of things to go through. I'm going to tell you a little bit about my group, Life Science Angels in Silicon Valley. I'm going to tell you how we work, what we look for, what looks like success for digital health, for medical device, for biotech pharma. I'm going to give you some advice, and then I'm going to hopefully tell you a little bit about what I see as trends going on in our space in healthcare and life sciences. So this is just um, advertisement. This is our group. This is our contact info. The nice icons up there are the people, the groups that uh, are essentially our sponsors. Um, very important thing that I'd like to tell everyone is we are a nonprofit pro bono club uh, investors. Nonprofit means that we don't make money from the club. We invest in special legal vehicles that makes a profit. I don't get, so the pro bono part of it is I don't get any uh, carry, any interest. I don't get a salary. All members of Life Science Angels work for free. So um, that's a, a unique thing for, for angel groups. And then we have special committees that focus on screening for digital health, medical device, and biotech pharma. Um, the deal structures are, there's a lot of content on this slide. The deal structure is very straightforward. I just mentioned, we create a special legal vehicle called a limited liability corporation that takes our money and our group of investors and essentially invests in your company. So when you see your cap table, your cap table will show one line item on it. and It'll say Life Science Angels number 22 or 23. We have a pretty good uh, track record. CB Insights evaluated all 370 angel groups across the country, in the United States and in Canada, and they ranked us as number one. So if you ever get an email from me, you'll see at the very bottom, we're very proud of it, we're the number one angel group in the country based on a lot of venture capital metrics. Teatros um, is one of our companies. You'll hear from Kimberly Cerrone a little bit later um, about what's going on with Teatros. We've had lots of exits. We've invested a lot of money. Uh, and we like to think that we're at least a fairly smart group and fairly active. Um, I just mentioned this earlier. Uh, angel investing, in my mind, is a contact sport, which means the principal reason why I do what I do is to meet people like you, because somebody out there has a cure for cancer, somebody out there has an amazing service or a product that's going to transform healthcare. It's all about people. It's a contact sport. So hopefully I get to meet a lot of you also. But we were ranked amongst uh, the top 20 or so uh, angel groups, and we're partners with a lot of those groups as well. I want to give you just some quick stats. You can read the numbers. I won't read them to you. But basically what this says is we have a very, very strong deal flow. We get a lot of deals. We do a lot of advice giving. In fact, the major part of our funding of our club, our, our nonprofit club, is towards education. So we consider that every time we meet with entrepreneurs, it's a chance to give you feedback, but not necessarily a check. In fact, we think the feedback is even more important than the check. Eventually, if you come back and finish those things, we will hopefully take a good look at you and invest. But the numbers basically show you what a very strong deal flow system looks like and how many total investments that we make. Um, you don't need to read this. I just wanted to tell you that we're a very structured angel group. Um, our process is very well defined. There are stages in which the entrepreneur moves through. There are stages in which our angels uh, do their work as well. And um, we just uh, we follow a very strict process when we go into due diligence. We follow a very strict process when we get you to a term sheet level and we bring you to a dinner meeting. There's a lot of steps involved. I'm just going to ask the question, does anybody know who that is? OK, keep that in mind. Um, as I promised, I said I was going to give you some ingredients for what makes a good, successful life science or healthcare company. And again, you can read the list. I've highlighted, I've bolded the ones I think are most important. And a lot of it has to do with people. The management team is a key part of the people process. Because that person or persons are going to hire more people. Uh, by the way, I believe you're going to get copies of these slides. So please, again, just uh, listen in. 
Strong intellectual property is a really helpful thing to have if you're focused on the sciences or in healthcare. And obviously having an understanding of your business is, is absolutely essential. We really try to avoid um, businesses that um, are masquerading as science projects. Uh, you know what that sounds like and what it looks like. It's, I have a great idea, it works in the laboratory, I want to take my laboratory out and I want to have somebody fund my research outside of the laboratory. Those are not areas that we really focus on. Here's a very, very, very important slide. And, and hopefully it makes sense. If, if you could write this one down, write this one down. A startup is not just fun or exciting, it's that, but a startup is essentially an economic package. And if you don't understand that, you really need to get that into your head. It's an economic package. You're asking people to take a risk in investing in you and your business opportunity for something in return. And the return usually is hopefully more money. Um, the investor's perspective is very clear. The slide says, so I don't make these things up. I borrow everything from everybody that I can find. The cost of capital right now is about 20% about or so. What are angel investors looking for? Well, more than 20%. Typically, people are looking for an IRR, a return on investment that is about 30%. So, and the reason for that is multiple. You can see all those things. Finally, what I would just leave you from this slide is your business opportunity has to make economic sense. So if you do the math and figure out what's going on with your opportunity, how much money you're trying to raise, what your exit value is going to look like, it's got to all make ex um, it has to be a win-win opportunity for everybody. Um, when you come to due diligence, is the full package. We need to see everything. Serious and savvy investors will all have a very detailed checklist. And I, again, highlighted the very important part of what we like to do during our research process, which is we like to figure out who you are, who's behind your team. Can you open doors on your own? Do you need our help? How do, we, how do we help you as an individual? But there's a lot of elements that go into that. The onus is always on the entrepreneur. So in order for you to be successful, it's not up to me to have to ask you the questions. It's really up to you to show how organized you are to bring the materials to our attention. And in fact, the more self-aware you are about what you have and what you don't have, the more interesting it is for us. One of my friends, quick story, told me a story about an entrepreneur who walked in and basically said, here are five reasons why I don't think you should invest in my company. Pretty unique approach, right? And then afterwards, he said, here are five reasons why I think you should. He eventually got the investment. It's a risky approach. But he basically said, I understand where my risk is, and I want to tell you what the risk is. So think about that. There's a lot of intangibles. It all, it all comes together. Again, savvy investors in digital health, look for all these things. Do you have a board of directors? Do you have advisors? Um, do you have good referrals? Do you have beta customers? All those things are important. Again, you know, how many of you love making products? I know there's a lot of people out there who love making products. I interview a lot of entrepreneurs who love their products. But then the real key question is, how many of you love business? How many of you wake up every day and say, I want to operate my business? I want to create my business model because I want to make money. That's what this is all about. And then, you know, if you read the, read the Steve Blank books and all the literature that's out there, finally you have to ask yourself, am I smoking something here or does everyone really understand what's going on? You need to get out of the building and go and talk to customers. Talk to 100 customers and do it as a team if you can. There's always, uh, always a folklore about what goes on in the Valley, what goes on in venture capital. But let me just tell you, the bottom line is exits make the best stories, right? So I'll give you a quick story. Moleculo, two uh, entrepreneurs come out of Stanford, out of a research laboratory. They told us we have the best thing since sliced bread. Okay, what is it? We can do DNA sequencing 10 times faster and more efficient. Are you interested? Yes, we're interested. What do you want to be when you grow up? We want to be a $200 million business. Okay, how are you going to get there? We're going to build this, build this, build this. At the end of the day, we realized their product was not really a product. It was a kit. And we agreed with one another it was a kit. So we packaged the company as a kit, went out to customers. They loved the product, and we didn't charge any money for it at all. Eventually, Illumina and others got wind of it, and within 10 months, we sold it to Illumina for a very nice figure. The entrepreneurs retained 60, 70% of the company. 
the investors, which was only us, we did pretty well as well. Again, I'm going to ask the question, does anybody know who this is? No? No? Okay. All right, fine. We'll keep going on. Um, I'm, I, I told you I'd give you some quick advice. These are not my words. These are words of my friend Chuck Stead. Chuck Stead was the CEO of Hawaii Pacific Health. He ran it for 15 years. He was a financial guy to begin with, and then he became CEO of a very large health system. I asked him, Chuck, take all of your years of experience from a health system and put them down to four or five slides and come on the road with me. Let's go talk about it. And he did, and I got his permission to share these slides with you. I'm not going to read them to you. Uh, you can see what it says up there. They're very, very, this is like 30 years of experience condensed down to four slides that you can read any time that you want. But there are important f uh, points here, which is the shift away from fee-for-service. We're moving towards value-based care. The fact that there is actually more involvement by providers, by physicians. The health systems now are taking more responsibility for closing the loop of care. Why is it difficult to get the attention of hospital systems? Well, go ask the hospital administrators like Chuck Stead. The reasons are multiple. Economics, policy, regulatory, government pressure, all kinds of stuff that are going on within the hospitals that are taking them away from you. Finally, I asked him, hey, put some, some words of advice to entrepreneurs, young people out there who are trying to create companies. This is his list of admonitions. Read them whenever you want. I'll just take you through just one of them. If you're inventing something for a hospital, then know what happens in a hospital. Don't just invent something that you think is going to be useful. Go inside the hospital, get out of the building, and go talk to people. Anybody? Okay. So this is my, my wrap-up uh, part of it. Uh, hopefully I'll end on time. Um, the investment climate, if you don't know what's been happening since 2008, I highly recommend you pull out the old newspapers or at least start asking people, what happened since the crash of 2008? A lot has happened. I've listed some of them. But the most important thing that's affecting you and affecting me is the fact that institutional investors that used to be there to help us with Series A and Series B don't exist. It's a very, very tough climate. There is a lot of capital out there, individual capital, family office capital, but venture doesn't really exist the way it used to. And if you don't understand that, you're going to be in for a big surprise when you try to get from seed to Series A. So it's been very, very difficult for everybody. Um, we are having some progress, but as you saw from how many deals we look at, we're being a lot more selective about our deal process. Um, the newest trend that I have to tell you about, if you're not aware of it, is angels, family offices, high net worth individuals, and corporations are playing a greater role in helping you finance your companies. So you need to be aware of who your angel community is. You need to get the list. You need to build trust from the previous talk. You need to build relationships and friendship with all these folks. But as I said, there are lots of angel groups out there all across Europe, all across the United States, and sharing and syndication has become the latest trend. So be aware of that. I think angels add a lot of value, and I'm biased. Um, frankly, I don't want to be a venture capitalist. I don't want to be uh, tied to other people's money and to be responsible for other people's money. I'm responsible for myself and for my angel group. So I think we add value in that we're not tied to any sort of um, fund or limited partners except our own uh, desires to do good and to also get a return. But there's a lot of things. I'm going to go to the very bottom of the list, which is as an angel investor who doesn't just sit in the United States but comes to Stockholm or goes to Helsinki or goes to Berlin, I see a lot of things. I meet a lot of people. So it helps me at least and my other friends who do the same thing see around the corner. We're just like you. We like to meet a lot of people. So I think there's a lot of things that you can take away from angels, but you have to be selective uh, not every angel is exactly the same. I also think that founders and angels are very much aligned. And I gave you the story of that young company that came to us from Stanford. The fact that they retained significant ownership instead of diluting their equity over time means that they were able to essentially walk away as millionaires rather than walking away with a big screen television, which is what usually happens when you overfund a company. So again, a lot of things going on with angels and founders. Um, 
and, and dilution is a big, big part of that as well. I already mentioned the fact that syndication has become a, a very, very important thing. I sit on the board of the Angel Capital Association. I run the ch I'm the chair of their collaboration committee. I'm the chair of the Life Science Syndication Group. So on a national level, I have really good contact with almost all the angel groups across the country that do anything serious in healthcare life sciences. We're seeing a trend where family offices, that's FO, angel groups, AG, and high net worth individuals are collaborating with one another because the next round of financing doesn't exist. Um, there's other ways um, to raise capital. There's foundations. Um, being lean, I've said this the other day in the grilling session, which is if you don't need to raise money, don't. You know, create your business and generate revenue and do what you can. This is an important slide. And again, I'm, I'm wrapping up towards the end of my talk here. Um, if you don't know that venture capital has changed in the past 20 years, I highly recommend you start looking into the literature to find out because you don't want to be surprised when you go out there and raise capital. There are other sources of capital out there other than IPO. IPO also is something that is very difficult to do anywhere that you go. Angels, um, strategic alliances, non-dilutive source of, of funding, they're all out there. You need to go out there and find them. You need to have lots of different options if you want to survive. So again, um, the capital markets are tight. The number of venture capital groups that are out there, I'll show you some stats a little bit later uh, on what's going on with the uh, number of uh, venture groups. They're declining. They're spending more time on later, later stage deals. So they would rather put $100 million into Uber or into a larger uh, company that has a going concern than to put $1 million, $5 million into several companies. Um, you know, you, you need to think about what's going on in that market. So if you just want to have conversations with venture capitalists just because you think they're cool or you think they're stars or you think they're some sort of celebrity, do it. But the only thing you're doing is just passing on information to them. What you really want to do to get your company off the ground is not waste time. Find the right source of capital. Find the right people who can help you open doors and execute on that. So this is, um, this is the reason why. Uh, the number of venture capital groups is declining. The stats are very obvious. The returns in the past 20 years for limited partners in venture funds has been just awful. So you could do better on your own. In fact, that's why a lot of limited partners are coming out. You're seeing corporations now taking on their own risk. So the data's out there. Again, um, I'm just borrowing the data from others to share it with you because it affects me. If my portfolio companies cannot continue to raise money and do well, then it affects my bottom line as well. And, um, you know, when things change, there's new things that happen. So I call the new form of institutional investors friendly capitalists because they're becoming what the original venture capitalists were. The original venture capitalists from 40 years ago were actually angels who wanted to help grow companies, grow entrepreneurs, help them achieve liquidity, and then have them do the same thing as well. And it's a nice cycle. So what's happened now is uh, more hybrid funds are being formed, which is terrific. It's a fund, it's a bunch of angels, and then it's somebody who might be a director of some sort, and then some other family offices might pile in as well. More collaboration, find out who these friendly capitalists are, and then keep them close to you and build strong relationships and trust. Um, this is, again, self-explanatory as well. So I told you, angels, and this is from 2010, but the trend is essentially the same. Angels are in green, and the venture side is in orange. So we do most of the early stage investing. We do the Series A. In fact, when we make a deal with you, we know that our pro rata rights means that we're going to have to help you do your Series A. So the trend is very, very common right now. Sa almost the same amount of money spent between angels and venture groups. Um, they get a lot more attention because, frankly, they own the media. So, um, so this is what's going on, but you need to keep it in mind. So I asked this question one more time. Nobody's answered it, so let me just answer it. Norman Vincent Peale. Um, if you haven't read this book, you should, because this is truly, it's an old book. It's truly what entrepreneurs are all about. And I'm not talking about having rose-colored glasses and looking at the world as all positive. That's not what his book is about. His definition of what a possibletarian is, he came up with the word. I borrowed it because it's my URL. It's part of my email address. But he says, 
a possibletarian. He says, I challenge you to become a possibletarian. No matter how dark things seem to be, or actually are, raise your sights and see the possibilities. Always see them, for they are always there. That's what an entrepreneur does. That's what a scientist does. That's what you do. So ask yourself the question, are you only interested in money? You're not a possibletarian. You're not really chasing after the dream of what most entrepreneurs want. If you're driven by passion and vision, energy, discovery, wanting to connect with people, then you definitely are. So I want to also reference a book here that might be worthwhile to go take a look at. Again, the slides will be available to you. Hearts, Smarts, Guts, and Luck. Um, it's an awesome book because it's written by a venture group that decided to evaluate their portfolio companies. And they wanted to find out what was success. What was it based on? And they knew it was the human factor. And they said, how do we learn from our 10-year fund and translate it to the next 10-year fund? Read the book and find out whether you are hearts, smarts, guts, or luck. And I'm going to just give you a hint. Self-awareness was the key factor. So what about other forms of capital? Don't you um, care about anything else? Well, yeah, these are the other things that everyone really does care about. Who are you? What do you know? Who do you know? Um, you, you just need to demonstrate that you're a complete human being, um, that there is something there besides the fact that you're chasing after money. Lots of great resources out there. I leave you with these books because I think these are important books that if you don't have them fundamentally, you should pick them up, read them, reread them, give them to your friends. Patterns now. So I just mentioned something earlier that you may not have picked up on, and I'll try to wrap it up very quickly here. I have two more slides. Um, when you read the media, try to find out who's funding the media. TechCrunch, other things. Look at the list of people who are in there and find out whether they're actually a startup company or not. Most of these media outlets are startup companies, and most of them are actually being funded by venture capital. So if the news that you're reading tells you that there is something exciting going on, read it with a critical eye, understand the narrative, find out who's telling you what it is, and then read another source, and then another source until you can, and that's what I do all day long. I'm trying to verify the information that's out there. There's lots of positive signals out there. I just told you money is tight, but that's good for you because that means you're gonna keep your equity a little bit longer, um, and you need to find the right source of capital for you. Um, there's new legislation in the United States that's making it easier for foreign folks to come in and do work up to five years, so that's positive. There's lots of shifts that's going over from corporations on creating new challenges, and you might want to participate in those challenges, whether it's the X Prize or the cure for cancer. And then there's a whole new thing going on, and the reason why you're here is the shift towards entrepreneurship is extreme. And we're actually moving towards entrepreneurial societies. And the Drucker folks have uh, a global conference every year. The ones, this one's happening in Vienna. Think about going. This is what's going on in our industry. And I leave you with this final slide. It's a far slide slide. If you can't read the bottom part of it, I'll read it to you. It's two spiders on a slide, a children's slide. They put a web at the very bottom. And it says, if we pull this off, we eat like kings. That's my final word. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Bashi. I ended on time. The downside of being main stage moderator is that I have to stop such a great presentation <laughs> as fast as done. So yeah. just round round of applause. Thank you. Uh, thank you for this crash course on the innovation climate and the key ingredients for startups and so much more than this. And we are going to talk, not me personally, but the cage commentators are going to talk with you even more. Okay. And I'm very much curious, do you have some questions for Faz now, Elizabeth and Bastian? Yeah, I think it's a bit of a teaser because we get to talk to him a bit later. And uh, thank you so much. I think Faz does an amazing job of uh, having the unpopular role of telling the truth, especially in this new um, evolution we're seeing in business development. So I want to know, uh, we're seeing so much uh, startups going after investors. And when did companies, my question is, uh, when did the success of a company stop being about getting customers and making money to getting investors and getting funding. Yeah, uh, so, so that's a long story, um, but the trend happened about 20 years ago when Wall Street discovered venture capital, and that's why everything's changed since then. So now it's become more of a superstar kind of thing, celebrity kind of thing, and everyone is urging you to go out there and come to them and raise capital. And so my friends who are in the venture capital industry, 
they refer to you as their proprietary deal flow. And I'm going, no, that you're not proprietary deal flow. These are individuals who are trying to do something great, and they're not proprietary in any sense. So, um, so, so then the, the, the media that essentially is being funded by venture capital is essentially telling you one line story over and over and over again. But I gave you one example, there's several examples, of where entrepreneurs do well by raising very little money, retaining their equity, and essentially walking away being very successful and then paying it forward. And we keep doing that over and over again. So it's a, it's a long story, but you have to be careful about what you read. Read multiple sources. Ask people also about what's happening. I hope that helps. And well, I think that's one of the great things about having you here and having uh, other people from Silicon Valley. And I think it's a perfect teaser for uh, the fact that we're interviewing you at 10.30. So we'll get awesome. deeper into that then. Thanks. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Faz. Thank you.